Take your Bible this morning, turn to John chapter number 6 this morning. <clears throat> John chapter 6. We're dealing with parts 4 this morning on nothing concerning the ability of God. This is the fourth message on this topic. Now, we've seen a number of things about nothing about the ability of God. We saw there's nothing that can abort God's intervention, His help, His will, or His plans. We saw that nothing compares to God's greatness, and He is not intimidated by men. We saw that nothing is hard or impossible for the Lord. Well, I like that. Uh, nothing needs to be added or taken away from what God has done because his work endures for other. Nothing can harm you when God protects you. And when it came to sin, Christ was guilty of nothing. Amen. So now we come to John chapter 6, verse 12. We see that nothing is to be lost or wasted of God's provisions. Look at verse 12, John 6. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Amen. Let's pray. Father, bless the message now. Help us to learn what you want us to learn from this passage. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. You know, there was a rich man who was determined to give his mother a birthday present that would outshine all the others. He read of a bird that had a vocabulary of 4,000 words. It could speak in numerous foreign languages and sing in three operatic areas. He immediately bought the bird, get this, he bought the bird for $50,000 and had the bird delivered to his mother. The next day he phoned to see if she had received the bird. And he asked her, what did you think of the bird, mama? What did you think of that bird? And she said, it was delicious, son. It was delicious. Now, you, you hear that story and you say, man, what a waste. What a waste. $50,000 down the drain. Well, waste is an issue in John chapter 6, verse 12. Now, look, looky here again. When they were filled, he said unto the disciples, gather up those fragments that remain that nothing be lost. After thousands of people were fed by the Lord with a little lad's lunch, Jesus instructed the disciples to gather up the leftovers so that nothing would be lost, ruined, or wasted. Now the question is, why? Well, one big reason is that leftovers can provide future blessings for other people. God doesn't like to see anything that he has made or provided to be ruined or wasted. He wants it to be put to good use, and he wants it to fulfill the function for which it was made. This same principle uh, applies to every single person in this room this morning. God has a purpose for you. He does. Well, you sure about that? Yeah, I'm pretty sure about that. And he says, well, I don't do anything. I'm nobody. That's all right. God has a purpose for you. He wants to use you for his glory. He wants your life to be a blessing to other people. All the abilities that God has given to you. Uh, he's given those things to you to honor him, and he doesn't want you to waste those abilities he's given. He wants the purpose he has for your life to be fulfilled, and that you will glorify him with your life. He wants you to do his will for your life. 
Paul said in Ephesians 5, 17, he said, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Romans 12, 2, Paul said this, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, by the changing of your thinking, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. You know, I've mentioned this before, but when we don't want, when we don't want to do the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God, we have a G-A-P between us and God. We've got a gap. It hurts our fellowship with Him. He said in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, he said this. He said, Wherefore, therefore, ye eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. You know, fulfilling God's purpose, that begins by trusting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and making Him the Lord of your life. Asking Christ to come to your heart, to forgive you and cleanse you of your sin. Trusting Him to take you to heaven. That's the starting point if you want to glorify the Lord. And as you grow as a Christian, the Lord desires that you not waste your life away on sinful living or foolish living. Uh, instead, He desires that you fulfill your purpose or His purpose for your life. The purpose for which He created you. He has a plan or a will for your life, and He wants you to do His will. That's what He wants. We should desire and seek to know His will and to obey His will. That should be the goal of every single Christian in the world. Psalm 143.10 says this, Teach me to do Thy will, for Thou art my God. Can you say that this morning? I hope so. Uh, thy spirit is good. Lead me into the land of uprightness. Every morning, we ought to pray, Lord, teach me to do your will, because you're my God. Lord, help me to do what you want me to do. <clears throat> you know, a guy named Red St Ray Stedman told the story of a time when, after a Billy Graham crusade meeting, he slipped into a seat on a bus beside a young man who had gone forward in the crusade meeting that night, and he had given his heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, trusted the Lord as his Savior. And Pastor Stedman st uh, spoke to him of what his new life would mean, and mentioned that he could now be free from all fear of death. By the way, you can be free of it too, if you know the Lord. Well, the young man turned and looked the older pastor in the eye, and he said, I have never much been afraid of death. But I'll tell you what I am afraid of. I'm afraid that I will waste my life. Oh, God help us. Pastor Stedman then commented and he said, I believe that fear is deep within every one of us. It has been put there by our Creator. No one wishes to waste his life away. The Christian who does not yield to the will of God for his life, end up, he ends up wasting the time and the abilities that God has given to him or her. And that is a tragedy for sure, especially for those who could have reached people for Jesus Christ, but they never cared or made the effort to try to get someone saved. Jesus told the disciples to gather up those fragments and let nothing be lost. It's inter interesting to note that the word fragments refers to broken pieces of bread that were left over. Uh, listen, if your life has been broken because of sinful choices, God can gather up the broken pieces in your life. He will pick up the broken pieces of our lives and he will use those piece, pieces for his glory if you'll turn them over to him. Don't get discouraged and think that all is lost if you have flopped and failed because we're all in the failure club. We all are. Uh, gather up the opportunities to serve the Lord. Use your time to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the unfortunate experiences at the Bema Seat of Christ 
is the realization of how our lives we have lived that many of us or most of us have wasted some of the time that God has given us. And I think all of us are going to rise when we stand before the Lord. There's more we could have done for him. May the Lord help us to waste nothing. Well, we see something else here. Look at John 15. Go there now. John 15, verse 5. We see here, without the Lord, we are nothing and can do nothing. John 15, 5, a familiar verse. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me... You can do nothing. When Lawrence of Arabia in, was in Paris after World War I with some of his Arab friends, he showed them the sights in the city. He so showed them the Ark of the Triumph, the Louvre, the Napoleon's tomb, the Champs-Élysées, but none of these things impressed those Arab men. The thing that really interested them the most was the faucet in the bathtub of the hotel room. They were fascinated with that faucet. They spent much time turning it on, turning it off. They, I mean, they would do it all day. You know, just played with the water. That's what they did. They found it amazing that one could turn a handle and they could get all the water they wanted. And boy, it was so cold when it came out. But if you wanted to get it hot, you could get it hot and take a bath too. Understand that water is precious to those who live in the desert. And that's where these folks were from. Well, later when they were ready to leave Paris, France and return to the east, Lawrence found them in the bathroom with wrenches trying to disconnect the water faucets. You see, they said, it is very dry in Arabia. What we need are faucets. If we have them, we'll have all the water we want in the desert. That's the way they thought. Well, Lawrence had to explain to them that the effectiveness of the faucets did not lie in themselves, but in the immense reservoirs of water to which they were attached. And he had to point out that behind this lay the rain and the snowfall in the Alps. Now, what a tremendous application for our Christian lives. Like the faucet by itself, individual Christians by themselves, without the help, without the strength, and the fellowship with Jesus Christ, they are basically useless. You cut yourself off from the Lord, you basically are wasting your life. They are like a branch that has been severed from the tree and it dries up and it just withers away. And there's so many Christians today, they're just withering away because they've gotten away from the Lord. Jesus said, without me or being severed from me, you can do nothing, nothing. The lives of many Christians are as dry as the Arabian desert. These Christians have the faucets of their abilities, their schemes, their plans, their desires, their goals, and their wills, but there is no connection to the living water because they have chosen not to fellowship with him and draw strength and refreshment from him. Other matters are more important to them in their lives. They do not draw refreshment from the true vine, Jesus Christ. And they basically end up doing nothing that has genuine value or genuine worth to the Lord. And that really matters. What does, it, what does the Lord think about what I'm doing? Does the Lord value what I'm doing? See, without me, you can do nothing, Jesus said. Now, Jesus did not say this. You can do a little bit. 
He doesn't say that. No, the Lord said, you can do nothing without me. Read that very carefully and let those words sink into your mind. That is a powerful statement. Uh, it is also a stern warning to you and to me. It beckons the believer's attention. This verse cries out the importance of being dependent upon the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, busyness leads to spiritual barrenness when you leave the Lord Jesus Christ out of your life. Do not make the mistake in thinking that if you have amassed a fortune, achieved great honors, power, or popularity, that you are a success. Don't make that mistake. That is the mentality of this world. But such thinking is hollow and empty if Jesus Christ is neglected or not in a person's life at all. Jesus cried out, without me, you can do nothing. You may be a Christian, but if you neglect your relationship with the Savior, you're going to be spiritually parched as you focus on matters that have no eternal importance at all. You may spend your time doing many things which do not accomplish anything for Jesus Christ. Your label will evaporate like vapor. Notice the words of the prophet Haggai, who said in Haggai 1.6, he said, You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. Oh, Lord, help us there. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. How many understand that statement? A lot of times we feel like our, our money's going into a bag of holes. Jesus said, hey, without me, you can do nothing. Now, some, you know, if I came in here and said that, I would probably come across as arrogant or proud or cocky. Without me, you can do nothing. You see what I'm saying? But when Jesus says it, it comes off, di it comes off different. Key. It's not being arrogant. Uh, first of all, what he's saying is authoritative because he's God. <laughs> he's got the authority to say that statement. Not only that, it's an accurate statement. It's also an alarming statement. God help us if we ever would neglect him out of our life. And not only that, that statement beckons our attention. Without me, you can do nothing. So you better listen up and do what I say and make sure I'm a part of your life. Without me, you can do nothing. You may seek satisfaction and fulfillment in people, praise, power, possessions, or popularity. But all these things will eventually leave you empty like a bird's nest in December. Jesus said, for without me, you can do nothing. Like glassy virgin lakes in snow-capped mountain valleys. You may search for serenity in your life in a variety of places. But Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. Uh, it ain't going to happen without me. You're not going to have serenity without me. You may feel squeezed like a sponge. And your service for Jesus Christ may seem to be overwhelming like a mammoth tidal wave hurled into a tranquil village by the breath of a hurricane. But Jesus warned us, without me, you can do nothing without me. Like ropes of braided hemp stressed and strained under the weight of a heavy load. You may be straining to conquer terrible habits in your life, in your own power and your own ability, but without success. That's because Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. 
David lost the joy of his salvation and was sickened by his wickedness because he failed to remember an important principle about the Lord. He left the Lord out of his life and the Lord told him, hey, without me, you can do nothing. Samson was left bound, bruised, and blinded by the Philistines because of his arrogance and flirting around with sin. He forgot a vital principle of God, without me, you can do nothing. I, Israel was defeated at a little town called Ai after their great victory at Jericho because they failed to seek God's direction before they went into that battle. They thought, oh, they're just a bunch of little guys and everything, just a little bit of people there. No problemo. That was their problem. Boy, they, they got their, their plow cleaned, folks. You know why? Because well, without me, you can do nothing. You know, like the sharp claws of a grizzly bear that put a vice on leaping salmon that jump from the streams. The stranglehold of fear and panic can blind us to God's ability, God's promises, causing us to retreat in defeat and miss out on God's best in our lives. The ten spies that were terrified after scouting out the promised land and the people of Israel, they forgot that victory is claiming God's promises is not totally dependent upon man, but on the help that you get from the Lord. They focused on the size of their enemies instead of the size of their God. They failed to realize, realize an important truth that the Lord said, without me, you can do nothing. Beloved, understand clearly that we are and we can do nothing without Him. That's it. Recognizing your own nothingness is a major step and a starting point to flourishing in your fruitfulness and usefulness for Jesus Christ. You can't do it on your own, but you can do a whole lot with His help. When you're doing it for His glory and His honor and with the power that He gives you, you'd be amazed what you can do in your life. You know, it's a key reason why God used men like a, the Apostle Paul in a great way. Paul realized his nothingness. He said in Romans 7, 18, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not, he said. Uh, Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 10, 23, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. See, anything we accomplish is because of him, folks. Amen. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. A key principle in that statement is the vital importance of being dependent upon the Lord. Dependency upon the Lord is stressed all throughout the scriptures. God wants us to learn to depend on him. Psalm 127, 1. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. 2 Corinthians 3, 5. Now, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, Paul said. Our sufficiency is of God. He was echoing the words of Jesus, without me you can do nothing. Paul was not relying on self-confidence in his ministry, but upon his God-confidence and God-dependence. And that is to be the same attitude that we're supposed to have in our lives too. We're to be God-dependent people and God-confident people. God-confidence and God-dependence will give you the courage that you need to face any difficulty that you go through in your life. 
Uh, God confidence and God dependence will help you to be devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ and His will for your life. God confidence and God dependence gave him self-confidence to do what the Lord wanted to do, and it will do the same for you. The Apostle Paul knew that his abilities came from the Lord Jesus Christ. And anything that was accomplished through him was because of the accounting of the Lord in his life. He knew that without Jesus, he could do nothing. Anything he accomplished was because of God's grace. God gave Paul the ability to serve him, and God gave Paul the ability to be effective for him. And he does the same thing for you and me. 1 Corinthians 15, 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. In other words, it wasn't a waste. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. God's grace working in the life of the Christian helps the Christian to do great things for God. Amen. And he'll use anybody who's willing to be used. Ephesians 3, 7. Wherefore, I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. God does it all, doesn't he? The apostle made it very clear that, that his sufficiency was of God. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 3, 5, the, the word sufficiency means this. It means ability, competency to do a thing, adequacy, qualifications. This word denotes the capability to perform a task that demands expertise. Paul's abilities and competence, those things came from Jesus Christ. Not from his self-assurance. He made no bones about it. The same holds true for you and me. No matter who you are, your abilities are graciously given to you from the Lord. See, without him, you can do nothing. Physically speaking, he supplies water for us. He supplies air and food for us. He allowed you to roll out of bed this morning. Amen. He keeps our brain functioning. Sometimes I wonder if mine's functioning full speed or not. But you know what? I just say, Lord, help me to remember. Help me to remember. Please help me not to forget my name, you know. But you know what? God helps us with a functioning brain. See, without him, you can do nothing. That is why you and I are to be dependent upon him for our needs. So the question this morning is this. Are you dependent on the Lord? Are you depending on him? Are you yielded to him in your life? Uh, are you depending on Him for your salvation? Listen, if you're here this morning and you don't know the Lord is your Savior today, you can open the doors of your heart and let Him come in. You can ask Him to forgive you and cleanse you of your sin and He'll come in. But you've got to open the door. You've got to ask and put your faith in Him for salvation. And if you've never done that, you can do that today. If you're a Christian and you've already done that, make sure that you're depending on the Lord. And realize this, without Him, you can do nothing.